Instagram series, Words and Music in Six Seconds, Grammy award-winning songwriter Dan Wilson explores songwriting, life, collaboration, the creative process, and everything in between. Today, Words and Music in Six Seconds is coming to you live at the ASCAP Experience Home Edition with the addition of a very special guest, hit country singer-songwriter Brandy Clark. Dan and Brandy, let's start the inspiration. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thanks for having me, Dan. Oh, yeah, it's a pleasure. Our oh, I'm good. You froze up for a second. I'm doing real good. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Now we've officially, this is officially a web appearance because we've both frozen at least one time. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I have, so um, you and I have uh, written several songs together and hung out and, and it's I've always uh, enjoyed that. And, but I've never really had a chance to talk to you um, maybe more generally about how you go about writing songs. And we'd, we've never really had that much, um, that kind of conversation, I guess. So this is sort of a first for us. But um, I thought a way to do this would be, um, as Sarah was saying, I, ha I have these uh, aphorisms, remarks, quotes, things that I put on, on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, which is just like things I, I think are like short, pithy phrases that I think might be useful for songwriters uh, um, as they go through their day. And uh, it started out on Vine, so I had to make them really short. So that's why they're called Words of Music in Six Seconds. Oh, okay. So now I've, I've made this kind of like mock-up of a, like as though they're like playing cards. And um, I thought a way we could we could, I thought a way we could sort of vaguely structure a conversation about songwriting, and and then uh, veer off into other subjects would be to t would be for me to show you these cards and and see what you think. Okay, I love it. All right. So one of the one of the first batches I made was called Ground Rules for Collaboration, and I know you're a, a very collaborative songwriter, and me too. Lots and lots of sessions with lots and lots of. of brilliant people. So I made these six um, ground rules for collaboration. And this is the first one. Uh, let's see if you can see it. Ground rules for collaboration. One, try it. Don't say no to an idea until you've, and then I've missed the last part, until you've heard it. I think that's huge for me. I, I only find that I can be successful in rooms with people I feel like I can say really dumb things in front of. Right. Because a really great songwriter, Bob DePiro, told me one time, there's this much difference between stupid and $250,000. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I think he's right. And I, and I think <laughs> that the rooms and like take money out of it, the rooms that feel the best creatively, you, yeah. you can say, you don't even have to preface it with, hey, I know this isn't it. You can just say, what about this? And somebody else can hear it. And, and sometimes all you need is somebody else to hear it and say, that's it. Yeah. What you might have been in, insecure and vulnerable to say. Other times they might say, wow, that's that's so cool. What if we said it like this and just change it a little bit? And you have to try it out. And I, I think one thing that I run into once in a while, and I probably ran into it a lot more early on, was... Um, if you made if you if you proposed something you know like um uh what if we what if we tried to make the, for example like, like what if we tried to make the song work without a bridge at all it, it, sometimes i think people are very quick to sort of do a thought experiment you know like well no that'll never work mm -hmm. but but i <clears throat> one thing i learned um along the way is that you have to actually t go to the trouble of like playing through it if you have enough material to try one with and without a bridge you can't really imagine sometimes it, it'll have an effect on on your ear that you didn't you didn't expect but that thing that thing about like people like i always find that if i say not it's not this but how but something like this and then i make a suggestion everybody goes oh no that's that's it actually yeah <laughs> well and i think that's probably i mean we've written together and i've always enjoyed the times we've written um but you're one of those people, I think, kind of like myself, you don't want to push your idea on everybody. Yeah, no, you I don't. You want it to be right. And sometimes yeah. 
I, I really think sometimes I say, I don't know if this is right, even when I know it's right. <laughs> I don't want to say, yes. this is it. You know, like, <laughs> um, because honestly, the times when, when I've been in rooms and been like, I've got it, I never have it. <laughs> It's so funny. Like we have to have that funny doubt for it to really be a good idea. Like I, I sometimes feel like um, if I'm slightly embarrassed about an idea, then it's probably more likely to be good than than if I just think it's like the dopest thing. You know, if if I'm if I just think I'm the hero now with this idea, it's not quite as good as if I think everyone's gonna laugh at me. You know, one hundred percent. When I'm nervous to turn a song in, that's when I know it's good. When I'm <laughs> so first time to hear it, um, when I'm not, sometimes it's it's not as much that way. But but when I'm really nervous to like turn a song into a publisher or play it for my manager or another songwriter, that's typically when it's good. It's crazy that we have to look for these strangely kind of anti-intuitive tells, you know. But it is it it is something that it, it is. I, I have a similar experience. I want to I want to. Here's another thing, and then I have a, a couple of questions for you about your, about a couple of your songs, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. Here's this one here. See if you can read that. What, what's a good enough subject to write a song about? If you've been thinking about it all day, then it's a good enough subject for a song. I agree with that. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of times if there's something, uh, like, for instance, where we are right now, I've written several songs about the state of the world in this time. And I, and I sort of avoided that for a while um, because then I thought, well, is that gonna be relevant once this is over? Mm. And I thought, well, I might as well just write it because I'm thinking about it anyway. Yeah. When I'm sitting here trying to write love songs, I'm thinking about what's going on in the world. So I might as well just write it. I think if a thought, I think that's a great, um, that's a great like school of thought if you are thinking about it, it's consuming your brain in a way that it might need to be something bigger than just a single thought. Right, right, and 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 I I sometimes wonder, like I'm not, I, like I don't want to, you know, I'm probably too much in the habit of putting little warnings and sort of quotes around the things I think, but but um, I feel like if I'm really obsessed with something or really, really thinking about it all the time, um, and I write a song about it, there's, there's a good chance that most people won't know exactly what I, even if I think I'm being super clear, uh, you know, they won't know what, what I'm going through, that, but the words will, will carry a, a kind of power and meaning for them, even if they can't put themselves exactly in my shoes, it, it has this, it transfers into their experience in a way. And I, and I find that, like, if someone says to me during a session, I don't know if that's relatable. I don't know if this, like, in L.A., that's a thing that people say. Is this relatable enough? And I always go, well, I, the only thing I can do is tell you whether I relate to it, and I'm totally relating to it right now. Mm -hmm. But that's as far as I can, like, I don't have a great what the masses will think or what all the consumers will think, I, I, but I can tell if I relate to it. And so it's like, that's the best slash only test I can apply, mm -hmm. you know? I think, you know, somebody told me one time, it, a record producer, I asked him how he chose the, the artists that he worked with. And he said, well, I figure if, if, I, if I'm moved by what they do, two or three, two or three million other people will be. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that, I think if we thought like that more often, we'd be more successful. <laughs> if there's a lot of overthinking. I know in Nashville, it's always like, is anybody going to say that? You know, and I'm thinking, well, we're saying it. We just <laughs> said it. <laughs> like, let's not worry about that and just write the truth, you know? <laughs> it's funny because when um, one of these cards, I don't know if I'll ever find it, so maybe I won't, and I'll just say it, and then we'll be done with it. But um, I have this experience where my relatives or my, my cousins or, or, you know, people in my life, uh, whenever they learn how many songs I write, they they always they always say, "Wow, that's a lot of songs, you know, to have out in the world." And I say, "No, no, no, they're not all out in the world. A, a small number of them get out in the world. The rest are actually not that great." And the person I'm talking to, if they're not a musician, they'll say, "Well, why do you write those then? Why do you write the 
why why write the ones that aren't good i think to me i i, I always think of everything in sports and nice. i think you have to go you're like a long distance runner right you're like a you're like a no, no i wish i was i played basketball <laughs> Many, many oh, okay. months ago. Um, I mean, the longest I run these days is, you know, down the hall. But um, oh, God. I mean, I am a power walker. When I go to or when, when I'm able to go to Orange Theory, I'm always in the power walker group. Um, but uh, to me, those songs that aren't as good are the practice days. Mm, yeah. And I feel like you get a few ideas every year that are amazing. And if you haven't been going to practice, you're not going to hit those ideas out of the park. Yeah. That's, that's how I feel. Yeah. So to me, it's just going to practice. And then one day, I mean, in your case, somebody walks in with a song, an idea like someone like you. Yeah. And it's an artist like Adele. And because you've been going to practice every day, you knew how to hit that. Right. That ball out of the park. Right. Right. It's so interesting because. I think about luck a lot being like I was raised in Minneapolis by Lutheran Norwegian Americans mostly and a couple of German relatives but that Norwegian culture is is very much like um, it's a kind of modesty that almost almost reads like false modesty to most people it's just so the, the modesty is, is so extreme that in, people from the East Coast could never even, you know, believe it was sincere, you know, mm -hmm. but it's a kind of like, well, I, I probably shouldn't get too much credit for that. I, I was just there when it happened or, you know, or, uh, or, you know, a lot of people showed me what I was doing and then I just was in the right place at the right time. I mean, it's really hard not to just say that about lots of aspects of what we do, for example, like kind of what you just said just now, like, you have a lot of ideas over time, but once in a while you get lucky in the idea. The idea itself is a break, as a stroke of luck. Literally, just the simple idea, and it has what it takes to become a great song. Not all the some ideas are maybe fated only to become good songs, mm -hmm. and you just didn't get lucky with the idea that day or the people you're with. You have to be lucky with the people you're with, and any so many different things. I was talking to uh, a friend about mentoring because she's mentoring some young people in her field, which is kind of uh, uh, the arts and culture and uh, progressive political uh, causes and, and how to forward those things. And she was saying that her that when she's mentoring someone, she has to be willing to mentor them at the very, very basic level and also at higher levels. And she can't be thinking like this. It, it's it's uh, inefficient for me to mentor them about the very basics. She, you know, they. I want to start at a higher like level with this kid, mm -hmm. but but she was saying that actually once you've chosen the person, you you just you're just with them at the lowest and the very highest level they they're at. You know, as a, just as a person and. So she was saying, you, you almost have, you just have to hope you're lucky in the, the whole person. Mm -hmm. I hope I have a good, I hope my mentee or whatever the right word is, is I hope I got lucky with them because I'm giving it my all right now. And that's kind of, it's true of all these things, like your, like your crew. I mean, yeah. you have, you have a, a community of songwriters. Do you feel like you got lucky? in them did they get lucky to find you how did that work like how did you, you know, come upon them i think we all got lucky you know that's the crazy thing and mm -hmm. i think when you find your your tribe or your community um it's people who believe in you and who you believe back in you know because mm -hmm. i really think that's what it comes down to because at some point you know throw a rock in nashville or la and you're gonna hit a really good songwriter. Um, but, you know, it's finding the people that see the world the way you see it in a certain way um, that like what you do and, and you like what they do. I mean, I always hate what I do musically. It bores me. 
Because uh, it's the only, it's just I've been in this body. You're not, so long. You're not, you're not entertained by it? <laughs> I've just been in this head and this body for so long, I'm tired of it. And so, but what I find is the co-writers that I really click with and that I've had success with, I, and I don't think of myself as a as the music being the part of the song that I'm really great at. But when I look at a lot of the places where I've had success, both writing for other people, writing on my own records, a lot of those those situations, I drive the ship musically. Whoa. And so there's somebody in that room that's asking me to do that because I'm not going to push that on somebody because the minute somebody else wants to play or you know pick up a guitar or a piano and, and i love what they do even though much like me they're tired of what it is i'll be like that's it that's amazing <laughs> let's um, do let's do you instead of me let's do yeah. your thing <laughs> and, so I, and i think also you find those great clap when it's really good and i'm sure you know this too is when it's both like mm -hmm. when when the sum of our parts is greater mm -hmm. than the, mm -hmm. when we come together and it and we make something that we couldn't have made Right. Separately. right. I totally buy that. Okay, here, I'm, I'm going to give you one card and then, and then apply it actually to, you can apply it, I can apply it to that thing you just were saying. Let's see. Don't worry too much if your song sounds similar to another, it's called having a style, it's a good thing. So I tried not to read many of your questions beforehand because I wanted to be surprised, but I did see that one. And that <laughs> one made me feel really good. <laughs> I worry about, I don't worry about it as much, but I used to worry about things sounding similar. Yeah. And when I saw that, that card, I thought, oh, wow, that's a, that's a great way to frame that. Yeah. Now, and really when you think about artists you love, they, they have a style and a great songwriter, like a great, great, great commercial songwriter, um, that I work with a lot um, is Shane McAnally. Yeah. And he told me that when he made a record, he, he had a record deal years ago. It was nine different artists. Like he, he, and he said, you know, he didn't realize at the time, but what a great gift that has been for his songwriting career. Oh. But it wasn't great for his artist career. Not for his artist side, yeah. Yeah. He said, you know, he'd be driving in and he'd hear a song on the radio and think, ooh, we should write something like that today. And Shane is so good at that. Yeah. Um, but th there's a real there's a real truth in that. You think about artists like James Taylor, you know, you know it's him when you hear the yeah. guitar playing. Um, you know, Ed Sheeran, right. the same way. Um so, you know, those are guys that are singer songwriters and that have had a lot of output. I mean, you know, clearly Ed's had less because he's younger, but you know, he's, he's made some great albums and, yeah. and there is, a, there is a similarity in what he does throughout an album. And, and I think that's where producers come in and maybe keep things a little bit fresh, but in new co-writers, but I think that card helped me a lot. Just reading that the other night. So interesting. That's, yeah. that's great. Yeah, I had to, I have to remind myself of that too. I just recently put, um, I, I just recently put out a, a semi-sonic song with uh, with my band, and we haven't recorded anything for 19 years. And I've done a lot of things in between, you mm -hmm. know. But um, it was interesting to me to like every time we get back together, we we like we. We, we have yearly done some sort of benefit or something just to hang out with each other. Like we'll find some show to do for, to, for some cause or, or, you know, some one-off thing just so we can be together and do our music. And I, I don't know if we've missed any of the years, maybe we've missed one or two years since we made our last album, but it's been quite a while. And every time I go to practice those songs, I'm amazed because the guitar tunings are all the same. Mm -hmm. there, there's no capo there's no weird chords all the chords there's like eight chords again and again and again there's it's the songs are all in three or four keys there's literally it's a very very aside from a couple there's like two outlier songs that are so hard to play on the guitar and they almost make the similarity of all the rest like more intense because it's like, wow, these two are hard to do. The rest are so easy. This is crazy. And I don't think it's just because it's because I'm me. These are like bus, these are like campfire chords, most of it, you know, uh -huh. just the simplest uh -huh. shit. So 
I, the first time I discovered that I, I had these two feelings at once. So when I was, I was kind of revisiting a whole bunch of songs and I realized, oh my gosh, that like E minor G, A minor C, D, sometimes F, probably not, you know, D minor, A minor, you know, just this, like, mm-hmm. e, just the, the, the utter basics of, and some, some a couple of bluesy little leads, you know, but I, it, it, on the one hand, I was slightly embarrassed because I realized how boiled down it all is. And at mm-hmm. the same time, I was kind of excited because it was going to be so easy to do the gig. Like, I was like, oh, amazing. No, no key changes. No, 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 no tunings, no capos. And when I came to, to the guys with a bunch of new songs, I was this time around in 2017 or 18, we started kind of messing around with new stuff. And I, I realized that the reason that the new songs sounded like my band was because they had that similar campfire song vocabulary. And that's all it was. And it wasn't really, I wasn't like pulling off some trick. It wasn't like scientifically, oh, I must only use these chords. I just happened Mm -hmm. to fall back in that pattern. And then it sounded like my band. It was like, oh, this is what we sound like. We have a style. We have a style. Whoa, who knew? It's a a good style. (laughs) I have a couple questions about your songs. Um, This is maybe not along the lines of uh the 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 royal cards um, but uh th- there's a couple of songs of yours that i find so moving and and i'm very interested like i might be way off base but like um three kids no husband mm-hmm. uh i was i'm very curious like I'm very curious how you related to that song, like how you got yourself imaginatively into that. Um, I don't know if maybe you should tell wh- whoever's listening who doesn't know that song. It's just, if you haven't heard this song, you gotta listen to it. It's just, it's so moving and it's, and it's funny and it uses, a, it uses kind of a, a small number of little verbal tricks throughout mm-hmm. the song to build to really a lot of power and, and in a really interesting way. So anyway, to, Tell so, us what the song's about, and then and then. I wrote I wrote that song with Lori McKenna, who's a great writer. Um, yeah. Probably a lot of people on here know who she is. Yeah. And we were writing in the. I walked in that day. Um, we were at her publishing company at the time, and she said, "Hey, I was watching YouTube videos of you last night, and I had a song called Pray to Jesus." She said, and you were, you were setting up that song, Pray to Jesus, and you said that you wrote it about a woman you knew who had five kids and no husband. I said, yes, that is the inspiration for that, for that song. And she said, well, that's a song. And that right there is a song. She said, I think five kids is a little extreme. <laughs> Just funny because Lori has five kids. <laughs> but, she, but she also has a husband that helps her out. So anyway, she said, what about three kids, no husband? <laughs> And um, it was not a hard song for me to access, No, nor was it for Lori. We both knew people, not just women, but, you know, I've known some single dads. And um, we knew that character, you know, so between us, it became a composite character. Um, and there are, some, there are some real specific details in there that, to me, Lori was the perfect person to write that with because I'd never heard somebody say hairnet job. Mm. And, yeah, you know, she, she said tries not to pick the polish off her nails, like those yeah. sort of things that really made you imagine that waitress. Yes, so so vividly. Yes, how did you guys come upon that thing about these um, these like that? She's talking about the the um, the these uh, the dishes in the sink can't the, wash the, themselves, and the, the 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 diner tab won't yeah. won't tip itself. The, these so, kids won't raise themselves. How did that happen? Happy accident. You know, that was a song we wrote top down. And so hmm. that first time it was the dishes in the sink ain't going to wash themselves. Yeah. And then the second time around, oh, wow, we could say in those lunch tickets ain't going to, you know, tip themselves. Yeah. And so then we knew, okay, it was a device. And yeah. we it again, and it was perfect 
you know, the, these kids ain't going to raise themselves. Oh man, that's that's that line is just crushing. It's so great. I just love it. every time. I feel so moved by that song and oh, that line. Thank you. Yeah, I it's funny because really lost in that one myself. And, yeah, and get a little choked up. So in so do, do you find that? I mean, if you say like. I'm so tired of myself and the things I think of in my own brain and my own thoughts. But every once in a while, you could write something that you could listen to almost like you're a, not a fan, but let's say <laughs> like a fan, you know, you just yeah. hear it. Go, wow. That's what it's like to listen to me. That's not so bad. Right. Yeah. No, every once in a while, you know, and sometimes, sometimes what I get tired of is my own voice. Like, mm. A lot of times if I'm writing in like an, another songwriter or artist sings the song on the work tape or the demo, yeah. Like it's different to me. But then sometimes I love my own voice. I'm not going to lie about that either. Like yeah, sometimes yeah. I'll hear a really great vocal on something and I'll be like, man, I was a real singer that day. <laughs> um, so I think it's just about the cer a certain song, you know, that hits you that, you, that you really can do that with. Do you... Um like if somebody records you really well and puts a little special sauce on it, do you feel a little extra love for them? I, I sometimes do. If someone records my voice really well and I listen back and I'm like, oh, I love you. This, this sounds so oh, good. I mean, I have such a such a soft spot for a good engineer. <laughs> I should say. Yeah. That yeah. should be one of the cards. You know, yes. you're, you're looking for a good engineer first and foremost. <laughs> it's important. You know, it's really important. Okay, I have this is I have a couple that are about pitching. Let me see if I can find. Oh, here this. Now we we've, we've gone over this. We don't want to talk about this. Um, okay, here's two. Here's two about pitching. Okay. Okay. And uh, and let's see if. Uh, okay, two two about pitching. We'll just do we'll do two in a row and then talk about pitching songs. Okay. So okay. here's here's the first one. A lot of artists think they, they can use their worst leftover songs to pitch to other people. I actually got to use your best ones. 100% agree with that. Um, you know, I've never, I've never had any luck getting the, the middle drawer songs cut. Um, I've always had to get my top drawer cut songs cut. And honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want my middle drawer songs cut, you know? In the end, maybe yeah. not in the moment, but... Um, I think you got to put your best foot forward always, you know, don't hold anything back. I mean, if you're an artist yourself and you don't want somebody to record that song, I think don't pitch it, but right. otherwise pitch it. And I think I really do believe too, that songs find their right home. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, you, 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 if you think, here's the other thing. If yeah. you think it's middle of the road, middle mediocre, What's somebody mm -hmm. else going to think, <laughs> you know? Like, right, right. Because an artist, if you're pitching a song, what I always think of with an artist, like I'll use an example. You know, I've had a song, a couple songs recorded by Miranda Lambert. Miranda's a great songwriter in her own right. So yeah. she's going to record one of my songs. She's choosing not to record one of hers. So well, why is she going to record my mediocre song? Right. If she's going to record a mediocre song, it's going to be one of her own, you know? What that I think it speaks a little bit to um, the way when people first realize that they need to write a lot of songs, they still are attached to the bottom 90%. You know, they still feel a, 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 an affection or a connection to their the, the, the rest of the songs, you know. Oh, yeah. And so I think sometimes they start to think, well, I'm not going to cut this song or, you know, maybe my band won't do it or whatever that, whatever the circumstance might be, but maybe I can get someone else to do these 90% of other songs. And that's, <laughs> that's kind of sweet because it, it comes from being attached and like enjoying, you know, I like my stuff, you know, or whatever. So you want to have it have some future. And it's a little crushing to find out later that like, no, the top 10% are the only ones that anyone's, unless it's a fluke that you were yeah. wrong, you know, yeah. At some song near the bottom is your best thing, but that top ten percent is like all that matters, and maybe it's more like the top two percent. But that's that's hard to accept because it means that a lot of your daily efforts aren't 
at the level that they need to be. How do you deal with that? Like, you know, it's funny. Maybe because all your songs are. <laughs> my first publisher, because I've always had a hard time um, pushing things that I didn't feel were in that top 10%. Right. And I would have co-writers that would push things and it would bother me sometimes. Like yeah. even that they would want to spend the money on a demo. And my first publisher said to me, and it was really good advice. She said, you know, here's the thing. You only want, you are, you are only looking at the house that's been built. You have co-writers that are looking at, well, we built this house, but now we got all this scrap wood. Let's sell mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so she said, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with trying to sell the scrap wood. She's like, it just bothers you in a way it doesn't <laughs> bother them. Um, I've always tried to be realistic about and, and honest with myself about songs and I've been wrong before both ways. I mean, I've had a lot more times where I didn't think something was great and then I'd play it for a publisher and they would be like, man, this is maybe the best song you've written. I've had that happen more than, man, this is so good. And them say, eh, I don't think so. You know, um, I tend to be pretty hard on my own stuff. Yeah. But um, because I, I also, for me, it's about management of expectations. If I, if I only expect the top 10% of what I do quality wise to see the light of day, right. then I, I'm not disappointed as much. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> right. you're right. right. It really right. probably is the top two to 5%. It's, it, it's, it's, it's funny because it's, it's like, if I, if I'm talking to someone who's just getting into the, the, the writing, I, there's certain things I almost don't want to tell them right away mm -hmm. because it's because it seems kind of discouraging. Oh, like yes. if you couldn't say what, you know, that story you just said, like, I think that would really kind of be, uh, make some folks kind of wilt, you know, about their hopes. And I think one thing that, that we got to keep in mind, like I was going to, um, well, you know, Dan, I would, sorry to interrupt you, but I would yeah, say, go the way I've always thought about it and it keeps me going is okay. So one in 10 songs is going to be really great. Right. So I need to get right in 10 songs. A lot, a lot of songs. You know, like, that's yeah. what really, that's kind of what keeps me going is, and, and I don't write every day and I don't write a song every day. I've, I've, I've tried to learn to work smarter. I've never been that writer that was really fast, but, um, but, but I also try to stay inspired in the doing of the deed, you know, right. like if I'm writing 10 songs and I'm, and it, when I'm in that song, I feel like it's top 10%. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me want to write the next one. And then, yeah. I, you know, you only get perspective looking back. So then I can look back on those and say, you know, this is really, this has really risen. And these, I was going for it. We were going for it here, but we just didn't quite hit the mark. I mean, we wrote it to the wall, but the idea just isn't as strong. Um, but I like to leave the room feeling like it's top 10% every day. If you have a, a, another thing that we don't always remember, or it's not, it's not a conscious part of the perspective, but if you're collaborative, those other nine songs are afternoons or mornings or days or whatever that you spent with people that are, you know, probably brilliant and, and often super nice and, mm -hmm. you know, super interesting. You got to hang with them and learn all day long, you know, about the, the, the craft you're into. And those nine days are, you know, it's like gold, but it's just, we, you know, we, we'd still want to come out with the, the one, the one out of 10, but well, it's easy to forget what happened on the other nine days, you know? You know what someone else told me not all that long ago, but you know, a couple of years ago, and it's really true, is that some when you talk about collaboration, sometimes it doesn't matter if you're writing your best song songs with someone else. Like let's say you and I, like you might think, you know, I don't write my best songs with Brandy. But from my side of it, my team might think, man, Brandy writes her best songs with Dan Wilson. So they're going to work really hard on those songs. Because <laughs> somebody, you know, really warned me about that with like younger writers, younger artists. Like 
if they're writing their best songs with you, keep writing with them, yeah. even if they're not your best songs in your opinion, because everybody around them is excited about, including them, are excited about those songs. So that's another yeah. way to, to so get interesting. more activity. It's like a big picture type type of thing. Okay, let me ask you about um, another one of your songs. And actually, like a, a, maybe a two, may, I, I, I'm, I'm going to guess too much here, but you can tell me about it. Like, I feel like um, Your Life is a Record. Is that the name of that? That's record? the album. I'll be the sad song. song. It's probably what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll be the sad song, but that, that album almost feels like, I don't say it sounds like, but it has the vibe to me of Katie Lang, a kind of, a kind yeah. of like torch singing. Uh -huh. kind of like beautiful torch singing record and it it came after like stripes and the like, almost what i think of as like your outlaw johnny cash album uh -huh. you know were you thinking or maybe it was two records after that actually but um were you thinking in terms of like those characters or those like the vibes of those records or did you have a did you have a picture in your mind of, of those different albums you know what's funny? I mean, I love that comparison, by the way. Um, is and I did, but my first two albums there was like Stripes and Girl Next Door and sort of that outlaw in your face sort of thing, which I love, yeah. and which which is a big part of what I do artistically. But this record is just as much a part of who I am, and yeah. and it's the first time I've gone into a record with a sonic concept. I always I, I always go in with an idea of what I want the record to say, you know, what right. I want, where I want the songs to live. But this time um, I challenged Jay Joyce to cut it all acoustic because he's mm -hmm. known for a heavier, aggressive electric right. sound. And I just thought Jay's the most creative person I've ever met. So I thought, man, if he would latch on to that idea, um, boy, wouldn't that be something? And yeah. when I suggested it, he loved the idea. Like, almost too much it scared me a little bit because, <laughs> and i said to him now jay we can we can use an electric instrument here or there he's like oh no 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 and we will but he said we'll be more creative if we paint ourselves in a corner huh. and so we painted ourselves in that acoustic corner there were only four of us that played on the basic tracks mm. and he said to me what could we do that would make this different than just an acoustic singer songwriter writer record not not that there's anything wrong with that but what could we do and i said well i love strings you yeah. know i just do yeah. i'm a sucker for strings yeah and i've never really used them on a record and he said oh you know you have to have so many <laughs> of them I don't know about that. so then it wasn't even taste it was the budget that was bothering him well, it's just <laughs> the sheer getting them in the studio and you know, recording. What a pain. Yeah. And so, but then that night, he called me and said, you know, I was thinking, what if we use Memphis strings and horns? And I said, okay. I mean, you know, I didn't, I was, I trust the guy. Yeah. He said, because, you know, Brandy, you don't realize it, but you're a, a more of a singer like, he was, he talked about like uh, Bobby Gentry and, mm -hmm. um, oh, Shelby Lynn. He talked about I am Shelby yep. Lynn. He said, yep. You're closer to that kind of singer than you realize you are. Yeah. And I think that these songs and your voice would work really well with that kind of production. And yeah. so we did three songs with the Memphis guys and we just sent them our basic tracks and they sent us back what, you know, what 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 they were inspired to play. And we loved it so much we just got a budget to do the rest I of it. It, it sounds beautiful and it does it, it feels like a kind of um i guess it you know it's interesting that you say you went into it with a with a sonic picture in mind and, and actually part way through you radically changed the mm -hmm. the sonic picture because I, I think of it as your strings record in a way like i don't, I, mm -hmm. I i i think maybe the katie lang thing does come from that like really strict stripped down acoustic instrument you know vibe uh -huh. but the way it sort of like you know blows up has a lot to do with the orchestration you know so it's interesting that you had an idea and then you 
radically uh, vandalized it halfway through and it worked out great, you know, so. Well, that's, I don't know how much you know about Jay, but he's really a genius. And when I worked with him on my first record, his engineer said to me, now just know there'll be a point in all this where you'll get really scared. And I said- <laughs> Where you'll get scared? Where you'll get scared? You'll get really scared. Because <laughs> Jay is like Bob Voss, the painter. <laughs> and he's going to be helping you paint this picture that you're going to just love. And there's going to be all these happy trees. And then he's just going to take one of those knife type dots in black and just go straight. To you. And you're going to be like, oh, I'm just ruining my record. And he goes, but then 20 minutes later, that slash is going to be a, tr a train track. And then there's going to be a locomotive. And that's really true. And, you know, that's also it goes back to what you said in your first question, I love about, that. or first couple questions about being being um, comfortable enough to say anything. Yeah. And I think Jay's one of those people that if you're gonna work with him, if you're not gonna give him that much rope, don't work with him. You're, you're not, not gonna, gonna get, get yeah. You're not, you're not gonna, gonna get, get the it. value. You're not gonna get the genius out of it. Yeah, the, the string thing was literally a one day decision. Like, Amazing. We're just listening to things and how, what could we do here? You know, just, he's always thinking. I love that. I love that. And I also love that. I mean, he's obviously comfortable with the more sort of outlaw rough and rowdy kind of vibe as well. It's just, it's just nice to, to work with someone who can go where you want to go. All right, here, this is, uh, let's see these. We've talked about these things. Oh man. Uh, now we talked about this. We talked about this. I just have to say, well, I want to say something about you. You yeah. know, you talk about communities, and I come out to LA some, and I've wanted to write there more, and I just wasn't sure how that would work for me. Yeah. But two, you know, you were there were a handful of people that when I came out there, it really gelled with, and you were one of them. So I yeah. just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy about the time we spent together. It's such a strange um, uh, moment in all of our lives where we're basically exchanging promises to hang someday when it's possible. <laughs> I mean, it's just terrible, but it's like a, it's a, it's almost like a, a mantra of this current moment. Is like, oh yeah, we'll we'll hang out again sometime. I'm sure, like. There were times, I guess, in history where people would have to go overseas and fight in a war or do something else and say, I'll, you know, I'll write you letters or whatever. And that's strangely, we're in the kind of like Zoom call. Yes. <laughs> very, 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 for me, very cushy version that like I didn't know mm -hmm. World War Two type of thing. I'm just basically I, I'm not hanging out with my friends and doing and jamming, doing the thing that I love to do. But that's, you know, we'll meet again. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I guess here. This is the last thing. Uh, uh, let's see about this one. Is it a great thing to bring a writing? Oh, can you pull it back just a little bit? It's a great thing to bring to a writing such compassion. Is your partner acting weird? Maybe they're just having a bad day. You know, I think compassion, I think we probably need compassion and empathy more than anything to be right. Yeah. You've got to, I, I once, um, I once had a session with someone that was kind of uh, uh, a famous writer that I was a little nervous about and excited to write with. And I, and she said, what's, what's going on in your life today? And I actually was, I was going through some really, really difficult changes with um, my, um, my older daughter at the time. And uh, I described that um, when she said, you know, what's going on in your life? I said, well, this is what's going on. And she took a long pause and said, well, that's a downer. And I was like, I was so bummed because it wasn't compassionate. It was more like, oh, you really, you busted my vibe with that story. But the opposite thing could happen if someone just like entered into my world for a moment it could have led to something really amazing. I'm not saying I told that story because I was looking for a song. I just blurted it out, you know. But if we have that compassion for our our fellow musicians, 
we can find amazing uh, inspirations with them, you know, and, and redemption in a way. I've written great songs with people that are going through divorces. Yeah. All because I said, how are you doing? Right. How's it going today? Yeah. And you can't go, oh, that's a downer when they tell you. 